Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to lesson three. Judging on the fallout rate between lesson one and lesson two, there should be about half of a person uh, tuning into this lesson. But I'm going to plow ahead anyway in the knowledge that in the future, dozens upon dozens of people uh, will be tuning in uh, to these lessons, keen to learn Latin. Do stick with it. Um, last week, we looked at verbs and we looked at um, how they uh, alter uh, and change depending on which family they belong to. This week, we are entering into the exciting world of nouns. Um, I bet you can't wait uh, to get started. Nouns are um, fantastic words. They are essentially what we call things, how we label things. They're uh, objects, things, people, um, and they are really important to the way a language works because they're the, the kind of substance uh, behind what's going on. So the verbs are all about action. Nouns are all about kind of things or um, <laughs> stuff i guess you might say at the end of this session uh, when we've got through talking about nouns by the way um we're going to move on with our study of roman history and look at the assassination of julius caesar uh, and why that may take place so if you can drag yourself uh through the next 10 minutes of grammar um then we'll get into the roman history at the end of it if that's the bit that you're waiting for okay bit of a recap first uh we looked last week then at uh, verbs we reminded ourselves um that verbs change in Latin, not because of pronouns, not because of words like I, you, he, she, it, we, you, they, which we use in English, but because of their endings. The ending gives you the information about the person doing the verb. We reminded ourselves that there are three persons. The first person, I, the second person, you, the third person, he, she, or uh, he, she, or it. And then, of course, they can have plurals, we, you, and they. And we reminded ourselves that we had looked at um, verbs like um, uh, porto, portas, portat, amo, amas, amat, narrow, naras, narat, naramas, naras, naran. We looked at those and we then reminded ourselves that uh, different verbs belong to different families, which we call conjugations. And we rather blithely um, assigned them over to um, crisp flavours, um, which seemed a, seemed a perfectly logical uh, way of looking at it. And we said that first conjugation verbs, they're the ones that go amo, amas, amat. Amamus, Amatis and Mant with their A in their ending. They are kind of like ready salted crisps. We said that second uh, conjugation verbs like Moneo or Mito, um, which have that E-O and the O, uh, the E ending all the way through. So Mito, um, Mites, Mitet. Sorry, I'm talking absolute rubbish. Mito is a third uh, verb. I just read it on the screen. So ignore me. I've gone bonkers. Uh, like Moneo, Moneo, Mones, Monet, Monemus, Monetis, uh, Monent, their second conjugation verbs and then third conjugation verbs like mito not as i just said a moment ago second conjugation verb mito uh mito mitis mitit have the i ending and then end in unt and then the really weird one the fourth conjugation which we'd kind of given to the prawn cocktail flavor flavor that divides the nation uh audio um which has its extra i but in the first person and in the uh the last part of the verb the third person plural so audio audis audit audimus auditis audiunt the only difference there doesn't really matter because we remembered that if we remember the endings ost mustis unt we can identify the person of those verbs really easily anyway but just while you're sat here see if you can now ignoring the mistake i made earlier on uh, sort these verbs into their different crisp packets give yourself a moment to try and then here we go so they move across like that. Porto, first conjugation. Moneo, second conjugation. Mito, third conjugation. And Audis, uh, fourth conjugation. So that was last week. This week, on to the world of nouns. Now, we talked about verbs having different properties or qualities. And what we said was that verbs have, um, they have person, they have tense, they have voice, they have mood, um, and, and all kinds of different things like that. Fortunately, nouns have a, an in, a sort of incredible um uh sort of um uh sort of short sort of small amount of uh qualities that we have to be aware of they're just number gender and case that's really really easy to remember number gender and case they're nouns now we're not going to worry too much about many of those things today number we've already talked about that's singular and plural so we've well, got one table or many tables gender um, simply whether a noun is masculine, feminine and neuter. And just for the avoidance of confusion, that's not whether you check whether a, a noun has a willy or not. Um, it's simply to do with the sound that it makes and the clothing that it wears. When we come on to adjectives, we'll talk about nouns kind of putting on clothing and they have to agree. But we don't have to worry about that today. Just be aware that nouns can have gender. The weird one and the one you won't perhaps be expecting if you've done French before or something like that is case. 
This is interesting. So now as I have a number of cases, I've only put two of them here. Cases have to do with the way the noun operates in the sentence. It's a really important um, kind of, um, uh, what would I say? Uh, it, 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 it's, it, it talks about the noun's function. What's it doing in the sentence? And I'll give you some examples. So let's look at this English sentence here. The girl kills the dog. Now the girl and the dog are operating in two different capacities in the sentence. We call the girl the subject because she's the thing who is doing the action. We call the uh, the dog the object. That's the thing um, having the action done to it. And kills in the middle there is uh, the verb, which we met um, last week. So they're doing two different options. If we put the dog kills the girl, we know that that sentence has changed. But the crazy thing is, in Latin, uh, you can move around the sentence structure as much as you like. There is no formal set word order in Latin, which means that actually you can't tell what a noun is doing in a sentence just based on where it comes. If we encountered this English sentence, kills girl dog, we would have no idea what was going on. Is it the dog killing the girl? Is it the girl killing the dog? We don't know because our language is built on knowing where things come in the sentence and those things issuing meaning. So let's have a little bit of a look. If the verb, the object and the subject are like this, that's absolutely fine, but it wouldn't work in English. Latin, however, as you might expect, has a really interesting workaround. It gives its nouns two cases. The first, the nominative case, the case for the subject, the thing doing the action. The second, the accusative case, the one for the object, the thing having the action done to it. So here we go. Girl, puella, puellam, Marcus, Marcus, Marcum, and Carnis, Carnis, Carnem. So here are three example nouns to use, and uh, sticking with our food theme, because it's, you know, we can't sort of uh, just eat without drinking. Uh, nouns also belong to little families. Um, in verb families, we call them conjugations. That's the way they're joined together. Nouns belong to declensions. That's nouns that follow the same patterns and rules. Our first declension uh, is puella. We can think of that as Fanta. It's everywhere. You get it all the time. It's really common. Um, the best drink in the cinema, by the way, is always the best drink in the cinema. Actually, I recently discovered that you can ask them in the cinema to mix sweet and salty popcorn together, um, which a, a massive innovation. That with a Fanta. You don't want to drink your Fanta too early, um, I find, because you, you're often conned by the fact that in the cinema they, they do these massive deals where, you know, for a, for a medium um, popcorn and drink, it's kind of 550. But for 570, you can have this kind of you know, you can have a, a camel full of, uh, of of Fanta. And the problem I sometimes have is you, you hit that Fanta too early in the film. And uh, and then, of course, you need a wee um, before the, the critical uh, thing. Oh, we've lost the track here. Right, back, back to, anyway, so puella, which means girl, is a first declension noun, which means it follows the same ending pattern as other first declension nouns. In the nominative, it's just puella, which means girl. But in the accusative, if it's having an action done to it, it becomes puella. For the second declension, um, I chose Diet Coke. Diet Coke, again, sort of uh, around everywhere, pretty common, except Europe. Don't know what's going on there. Go to Italy, go to France, go to Spain. Can't get a Diet Coke for love nor money. They've all moved on to Coke Zero, which just uh, doesn't taste as good. Doesn't taste as good. It's, uh, it's not, uh, anyway. Uh, so Marcus um, is a second declension noun, and it follows second declension endings. Marcus, the us ending, which is the ending most people associate with Latin. When you hear idiots trying to pretend they're talking Latin, they just put us on the end of things. Uh, so Marcus, but then in the accusative, Marcum. Uh, then dog. Now, dog is a third uh, declension noun. And I, I've kind of gone with lilt for that. Now, the reason for that is that lilt, not everybody likes it. Um, it has to be, you have to be in the right mood. And third declension, um, third, third declension uh, nouns are a bit like that. They're a bit weird. They're a bit odd. In fact, their first part, the part that goes into the nominative, can kind of end in anything. Um, they're very strange, but they do share then this accusative in M. Now, what the brainy among you will have noticed is that accusative endings, that's the case for the thing having the action done to it, end in a m sound. Uh, and I want you to think about that in terms of the accusative. If you accuse someone of something, you go mm, or you did um, if you were at school in the Victorian era, uh, like I was. So that mm, it's the accusative should remind us it's having the action done to it. If you see that mm at the end of a noun, it's very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely it's going to be doing the verb. It's more than likely it's having it done to it. So let's have a look. Marcus canis necat. Now, if I tell you that the verb neco, which is a first conjugation verb, a ready salted verb, 
Neko, uh, Nekas, Nekat, Nekamas, Nekatis, Nekant means kill. See if you can translate that sentence. Just pause for a moment. Now, you should have had trouble with that because the problem we've got here is we've got two nouns in the nominative. Marcus is doing the action and Carnis is doing the action. So it will be impossible to tell who was doing the killing. And in fact, there's nobody in the sentence to be killed, which is why we need the accusative. Let's change it to this. Marcus Carnem Nekat. Have a little think, see if you can translate. Hopefully, oh, I've skipped ahead too far. Hopefully, for this sentence, Marcus Carnem Nekat, you've got the translation, Marcus kills the dog. It cannot be the dog kills Marcus because of that mm ending on the end of Carnis, which tells us that it's in the accusative case. Similarly, Marcus can't be being killed because he's got his us nominative ending on. So that all goes together, Marcus Carnem Nekat. Okay. Marcum Carnis Nekat. This version of it shouldn't take you too long. Take a moment, see if you can translate. Okay, Marcum Carnis Nekat. Marcus is not the thing doing the object of doing, doing the verb here. Uh, he, he can't be, even though he's at the front of the sentence, he's not doing the verb because he's got his um ending on. So in this instance, it's the dog who kills Marcus. This is very bloodthirsty. I don't know for this exceedingly dark example, but there we go, it's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Okay. What I'd like you to think about is putting the word puella into that sentence for girl. I don't mind which way you want to do it, whether you want to make it the girl uh, killing the dog, the girl killing Marcus, even, or Marcus killing the girl or Marcus killing the dog. But just see if you can position puella in that sentence. Take a moment now. OK, hopefully you've done that. Well, the two incarnations with the dog involved would be this. Puella canem necat. So the girl kills the dog, the dog with the accusative ending. Puelam canis necat would be the uh, the dog kills the girl because puella has now got its m on, which means it's the accusative form. This is pretty simple and straightforward. We actually do the same thing in English if you think about it with the words he and him. For example, he shot the bird. If the uh, situation is reversed, we say the bird shot him. So we make the same change in English. We just don't think about it in the same grammatical way, and we don't do it with all of our nouns and verbs. OK, so let's have a little bit to think about plurals. We've done the nominative. But what if we have more than one girl? Well, girl becomes puelai in the nominative and puelas in the accusative. Marcus becomes marki in the, the nominative and then marcos in the accusative. And dog becomes canes and then canes, which is slightly confusing. Don't worry too much about the nominatives for now because they, they really don't matter to us um, uh, for the purposes of this exercise. But what's worth remembering is when we have it in the singular, the accusative is usually mm, uh, and when it's in the plural, it's like booing a bad uh, pantomime villain um, off the stage. Saw a panto uh, Christmas this year, actually interesting. Haven't seen one uh, in a little while. Um, it was a great scene where the, uh, the it was Captain Hook and uh, his his cronies were, were rowing across the stage in a boat and it broke down. Um, there we go. Anyway, uh, you needed to know that's important. Please like and subscribe. Uh, OK, uh, so let's look at some examples then uh, with a, uh, a plural involved. So we have here Marcum Carnes Necat. We have Marcus kills uh, the, the the this has gone wrong. This has gone wrong. What, have I, what mistake have I made here? Well, it should be Marcus, not Marcum, uh, because we have to have somebody doing the action. If it were the dogs killing Marcus, I'd made to make another change. I need to change that verb to necant. Let's assume it should be Marcus carnes necat there would give us that plural. Let's have a look at this one. Puelas Marcus necat. OK, in this sentence here, take a pause. See if you can um, uh, see if you can tell me what's going on here. Excellent. Uh, so what we've got here is Marcus kills the girls. The girls have got their ass ending there, which tells us they are in the plural. OK, so that's probably enough grammar for this week. And we'll come back next week and look at um, another case, which is the dative case. Don't worry about that too much. But now there may be a song uh, involved in the dative case. It's 
possibly the only way to uh, to teach it effectively. Um, but so, you know, look forward to that for next week. But I thought we'd pick up where we were last week. We talked about the fact that the Roman Empire, its system of government had deteriorated. It wasn't brilliant for ruling an entire empire because it was raising up great men who wanted to be able to retain their power. And one of these great men was Julius Caesar. Now, by the mid 40s BC, Julius Caesar has got rid of his two biggest competitors, Marcus Crassus. Marcus Crassus, an interesting uh, fellow. He made an enormous amount of money. He was an incredibly wealthy man. He was said to have pools in his houses uh, where he had great eels swimming in them as a kind of a feature. And he put jewellery on the eels. Um, so, so much was the, the wealth that he had. And an interesting strategy for gaining wealth did Marcus Crassus. Um, he did it by buying up property in Rome. And what he would do is he would send a, a group of thugs or ruffians out and they would set fire to a nice looking house. And all the people would come out of the house in great panic. And Marcus Crassus would stroll up and go, oh, I'm sorry about your house. That's clearly going to burn to the ground. Um, I tell you what, I'll, I'll pay you about a tenth of what it's worth. It's, it's the most I can do. And people will go, oh, yes, thank you. Anything at this point. Uh, so Marcus would do the deed, the, the money would be handed over, and then his own personal fire service would turn up and put out the fire, uh, meaning that he acquired properties for um, a, a lot less than they were worth. Anyway, Julius Caesar has got rid of Pompey the Great. He's got rid of um, Marcus Crassus. He really is now um, the main man in Rome. He's done so much conquering. He brings his army back and he brings his army back across the Rubicon. Now, in their minds, people often think about the Rubicon as being some great river that Caesar pushes his army across. Actually, the Rubicon is no more than, than a stream, but it's a symbolic boundary. You are not supposed to bring an army within the boundary of the city of Rome. And Julius Caesar does this, um, which is a very complicated move. Lots of the senators don't like this, and two of them, Brutus and Cassius, who are good men who believe they're doing the right thing, believe that Caesar has become a tyrant, somebody who's just going to wield power by himself and ignore the rest of the Roman government. So they decide he has got to go. And in Roman law, it is legal to kill uh, a tyrant. Um, and so they led a conspiracy, as you will know. And uh, as Caesar uh, was in the centre of Rome one day, they and all of the uh, the other their, their co-conspirators um, stabbed him. Now, this is a complicated move because it's going to please the upper classes. It's going to please some of the middle classes. It is not going to please the lower classes who liked Caesar. They thought he was dynamic. They thought he was exciting. They really quite liked him. In fact, actually, people had been in the forum shouting for him to be made uh, king. Such was his popularity a little bit before. The complication is that Caesar's will is a little bit odd. It gets read in the forum by um, Caesar's right-hand man, uh, Mark Antony, and it says that Caesar's giving basically 100 quid, more or less, um, to every uh, every person who lives within the walls of Rome. And so everybody's sort of mourning the death of Caesar, which makes Brutus and Cassius uh, look pretty awful, pretty bad. Um, so they have to flee. They have to actually get out of Rome. The other peculiarity of Caesar's will is that it names as his heir, as the person who's going to succeed him, somebody that nobody's really ever heard of, a guy called uh, Gaius Octavius, um, who is Caesar's sort of uh, grandnephew. And he's really not in the public eye at all. He's a very young man. Um, he was only 19. Um, and uh, nobody really knows what to make of this because everybody had been expecting Caesar to give his power to Mark Antony or somebody like that. But no, it goes to um, uh, this, this guy, uh, Octavian. And this puts the whole situation into a really difficult place. Rome goes into turmoil. The assassins who'd come up with the idea of killing Caesar um, have also um sort of come up with a no real kind of escape plan or no no real idea of what's going to happen next so the rome is in in in, in tumult it's in a really difficult place uh, at this point in time um what happens next is that uh, Mark Antony decides he wants to go and rule a really, really rich province. You know, we talked about going out and ruling a province being a good way to kind of get um, get power, get responsibility, get authority. So he decides he wants to take himself off and rule um, uh, sort of um, the, the Cisalpine Gaul, which is a very rich province. Problem is, there's already somebody there, a guy called Decimus Brutus. But uh, Antony doesn't mind. He takes his own army up there and decides to kind of take over uh, in his own right. Rome does something unusual. They turn to Cicero, uh, one of their former leaders, and Cicero suggests that they talk to Gaius Octavius, the young man that Julius Caesar has named in his will, and they ask him to go and uh, sort out Mark Antony, get rid of him. Uh, and so we're going to leave the story there for this week. They give Mark Antony an army, uh, they give uh, uh, Gaius Octavius an army, and they send him up north into Italy. <laughs>